uh, an activist and a vocal, uh, vocal activist for women empowerment, democracy and minority rights in Pakistan. He has also been a harsh critic of the nuclear weapons programs and the arms race in South Asia. His uh, achievements are too numerous for me to list here. And uh, without further ado, I will hand over the mic to Dr. Goodboy to give us his thoughts on the topic of Islam and science. Thank you, Ayas. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I am uh, quite delighted to be in this lovely town. Just, uh, browsing through a bookstore, and I came upon a very nice book, Lady Gresham's Book of Etiquette. I found a recommendation over there that when in polite company, never talk about religion or politics. In fact, it's recommended that uh, one talk only about the weather, but given the weather over here, <laughs> I think I'll, I'd prefer to talk about the other two. Well, um, perhaps the best way for me to get into the subject of Islam and science is to make three propositions, three clear assertions. And these will be fairly strong. You might not agree with them. And certainly you are at liberty during the question and answer session, which I think uh, will be about the same length of time as uh, my talk over here, in which you can dispute these assertions. Well, let me make as my first proposition that uh, with more than a billion and a half Muslims across the globe, Muslims are not to be seen in the world of science. That is, they have essentially disengaged from the process of creating knowledge. Both in science, as, both in the natural sciences as well as the social sciences, and also in most forms of creative endeavor. Now, when I speak of science or the social sciences, I want to make a clear distinction that we're, I'm not talking about the products of science. I'm not talking about technology because everybody seems to be very happy with technology. Even the Taliban use cell phones. But what I'm talking about is creating new things. Now, of course, that's a kind of progress that uh, there is not that reticence in the use of technology as once existed. So, in fact, uh, the loudspeaker is no longer resisted, penicillin is no longer resisted, although it was at one time, as was the printing press. But that's in bygone ages. Now, there is an eagerness to embrace new technology. However, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about new knowledge. It wasn't always this way, as you certainly know. Between the 9th and the 13th century, the only people on this planet who were doing creative work, creating science and new knowledge, were Muslims. You owe the, the invention of algebra to Muslims. You owe major developments in medicine, in astronomy and mathematics to Muslims. And certainly, it's a fact that the European Renaissance and the scientific revolution owes an enormous amount to Muslim achievements. These have been ignored by the West for a very long time, but uh, no serious historian of science ever denied it. You have the five volumes of George Sarton, History of Science, and one and a half of those volumes were exclusively devoted to Muslim science. And yet, all that seems to lie far in the past. For the last 700 years, well, there is no major invention, no major advance of knowledge that you can point to that has been created by Muslims. So that golden age is gone. But nevertheless, as I said, I made an assertion, an assertion that I now want to back up. 
If I say that Muslims are not to be seen in the world of science, what do I actually mean by that? And so I will propose four different metrics. The first is the quantity of science, weighted by some kind of reasonable measure in terms of uh, its importance and its relevance. Okay, so how do you do that? It's not very easy, but one thing that you can do is uh, count the number of papers and count the number of citations that you have in scientific journals. <coughs> right, now if I can have uh, the first slide now. Can you, sorry, I didn't figure out how you Half Muslim and half uh, 